Hi, my name is Tom Sokolovsky and I'm a nutritional therapist and a functional medicine practitioner. Are you still depriving yourself of the tastiest part of the chicken by removing the skin? Are you reducing not only your pleasure but your health by choosing low-fat options? Do you still need some convincing about the dangers of the low-fat diet? This is the final part of a four-part series on the fallacy of the low-fat and low-saturated fat diets. In the previous video I focused on the health benefits of saturated fat. In this video I will give you some more reasons why you should not be choosing low fat options and I will give some simple guidelines on how much fat to eat. So what happens if we manage to stick to a low fat diet because it's not easy to stick to? A low fat breakfast will cause us to crave lunch earlier and adding saturated medium chain triglycerides from coconut oil to a breakfast containing carbohydrates would have a particularly satiating effect when compared with longer chain saturated and monounsaturated fatty acids. Low dairy fat intake has been associated with increased central obesity, i.e. belly fat, when compared with high dairy fat intake, and central obesity is associated with an increased risk of heart disease, type 2 diabetes and dementia, as well as an increased risk of anxiety and depression. When the diets of 937 elderly people were tracked for a median of 3.7 years, increased carbohydrate as a portion of total caloric intake was associated with an increased risk of mild cognitive impairment or dementia, whereas increased fat or protein intake as a percentage of total caloric intake was associated with a reduced risk. Dietary intake analysed for 2,569 women with breast cancer and 2,588 women without breast cancer found that, and I quote, the risk of breast cancer decreased with increasing total fat intake, whereas the risk increased with increasing intake of available carbohydrates. Longer chain fatty acids encourage bile flow, which not only aids in the absorption of fat soluble micronutrients, has antifungal and antimicrobial properties, but it's one of the main routes to rid your body of toxins and hormones such as thyroid and excess estrogen. This may also be why weight loss with a low fat diet is associated with gallstone formation, whereas the high fat diet reduces the risk of gallstone formation and would thus be a safer way to lose weight. Even if you already have gallstones, there is no need to go on a low fat diet as this will not reduce the risk of the gallstones blocking your common bile duct. Low-fat dairy produce may reduce fertility in women, whereas high-fat dairy produce may increase fertility in women. Insulin resistance from a high-carbohydrate diet is associated with polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS, which is associated with around 30% of causes of infertility in couples seeking treatment. During pregnancy, women need adequate fat intake to help meet caloric needs and to avoid a low birth weight, since a low birth weight is associated with an increased risk of congenital heart defects, infant mortality, and adult obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and depression. There are also greater demands on DHA and EPA during pregnancy, and these long-chain omega-3 fatty acids may benefit maternal mental health and reduce postnatal depression, as well as increase the IQ of the coming child in early life. Usually we're concerned with too much fat tissue, but with eating disorders and certain extreme diets, could too little fat tissue impact health? Well, in fact, not enough adipose tissue will negatively impact metabolic health, and when anorexic women begin to put weight back on, it tends to be in the form of inflammatory fat around the middle, belly fat. Adipose tissue may increase your chances of survival from critical illness due to its endocrine functions, and possibly by acting as a buffer for toxins during illness. Adipose tissue may have a role in clearing excess cholesterol from the blood, as has been demonstrated in mice at least. Interestingly, circadian clocks that regulate metabolism are also found in the fat tissue. Adipose tissue also supports fertility in women and healthy breastfeeding. Although belly fat has a negative impact on bone mineral density, Subcutaneous fat has positive effects on bone mineral density in women. Finally, it's interesting that having more adipose tissue used to be a sign of health, status and beauty when calories were less readily available, 
And now in the era of caloric abundance and the knowledge of the health risks of being overweight, being slim is a sign of beauty in the Western world. And this has contributed to the popularity of the low fat diet. It's really appreciated that a certain amount of fat plumps out your skin and reduces wrinkles, thus increasing youthfulness and beauty as they would be commonly perceived in this age in the West. Furthermore, as I mentioned in the previous video, total fat intake and saturated fat intake has been associated with reduced wrinkles. So getting back to the big issue of heart disease and saturated fat, this 2017 editorial states that, and I quote, in comparison with advice to follow a low fat diet, 37% fat, an energy unrestricted Mediterranean diet, 41% fat, supplemented with at least four tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil or a handful of nuts achieved a significant 30% reduction in cardiovascular events in over 7,500 high risk patients. So this editorial also includes this illustration highlighting some key heart disease prevention strategies and you can see the focus is more on reducing carbohydrates rather than fat intake. As for the advice to lose weight by adopting a low-fat diet, this 2014 paper states that, and I quote, due to both psychological, e.g. the tendency for people to eat more of what they consider low-fat, and physiological, e.g. the low satiety that accompanies carbohydrate intake, so due to the psychological and physiological factors, reducing total caloric intake while simultaneously reducing fat intake is a difficult challenge. Further, reductions in total carbohydrate intake, increases in protein intake, and adoption of a Mediterranean diet seem to be more effective in inducing weight loss than reductions in fat intake. Traditional claims that simply reducing dietary fat will improve metabolic risk factors are also not borne out by research. And a 2015 article in the journal Nutrition has this to say, I quote, Americans in general have been following the nutrition advice that the American Heart Association and the US Departments of Agriculture and Health and Human Services have been issuing for more than 40 years. Consumption of fats has dropped from 45% to 34%, with a corresponding increase in carbohydrate consumption from 39% to 51% of total caloric intake. In addition, from 1971 to 2011, average weight and body mass index have increased dramatically, with the percentage of overweight or obese Americans increasing from 42% in 1971 to 66% in 2011. General adherence to recommendations to reduce fat consumption has coincided with a substantial increase in obesity. Please note that I am not recommending huge quantities of fat. Fat tends to be satiating, but too high a caloric intake is not what we evolved to deal with, and the current environment of caloric abundance is believed to be a key driver behind not just obesity and type 2 diabetes, but also the other great killers of our time, such as heart disease, neurodegenerative disease and cancer. As I explained in the previous video, polyunsaturated fatty acids are more prone to oxidation, and yet as I explained in part 2 of this series, we need polyunsaturated fatty acids just as much as we need sterols such as cholesterol, which can also be readily oxidised to form damaging compounds that can oxidise LDL lipoprotein particles, which increases heart disease risk. The primary culprits to cause the damage are lipid hyperperoxides, which can be elevated in your bloodstream for two to four hours after eating a fatty meal. Your body will make the cholesterol it needs, so it's not a matter of avoiding cholesterol or polyunsaturated fatty acids. The first step to protect yourself is to cook only with oils less prone to oxidation, which I have discussed in my video, Which Fats and Oils for Optimal Health. Then you can further reduce oxidation after meals by combining fatty foods with sources of polyphenols from plant foods such as berries, red grapes and pomegranates, which are rich sources of flavanols, anthocyanins and procyanidins. It's probably the procyanidins in red wine that can also reduce the oxidation of LDL particles. For more information on when alcohol may or may not be beneficial, please refer to my videos on hormesis. 
Other compounds that have been shown to reduce oxidative stress after meals include proanthocyanidins found in many berries and other fruits, legumes, tea, red wine, grapes and cocoa. Virgin olive oil is rich in polyphenols that get incorporated into the LDL particle and this is likely to be how olive oil reduces LDL oxidation. Cocoa polyphenols in dark, preferably 100% cocoa solid chocolate can also prevent the formation of lipid hyperperoxides in LDL particles and thus reduce heart disease risk and green tea polyphenols can also reduce LDL oxidation. Coffee is in fact also protective and this is probably due to the incorporation of phenolic compounds from the coffee into the LDL particles. If you are avoiding caffeine, I recommend green tea and coffee that has been decaffeinated using just water or carbon dioxide to avoid residual solvents in your beverage. Adequate selenium intake also protects the LDL particles from oxidation and I recommend 200 micrograms a day from foods or perhaps a supplement with a variety of selenium compounds such as a natural yeast based selenium supplement. Avocado can reduce inflammation from lipid peroxides though some of this effect may come from the high monounsaturated fatty acid content. Low quality fats without polyphenols at the same meals can also increase the absorption of bacterial endotoxins which are highly pro-inflammatory. Too much saturated fat may increase the absorption of endotoxins from gram-negative gut bacteria though they may also have a protective effect from the endotoxins by reducing intestinal permeability as I mentioned earlier. However, this increase in endotoxemia after eating saturated fat may only be significant in obese people and only when these obese people eat large 40 gram portions of fat. Also, combining high fat with high carbohydrate, high glycemic foods will increase the release of chylomicrons into the gut that then transport more endotoxin into the bloodstream. So please avoid this combination. Perhaps the best advice, not just for overweight people, is to avoid very large portions of fat, to have low glycemic meals and to counter any inflammation with monounsaturated fats from avocado, extra virgin olive oil or avocado oil. For more information on low glycemic meals, please see my video Blood Sugar Balance, the key to health, weight loss and stress reduction. I have already described how fats can help prevent leaky gut. So the key here is not to avoid fats, but to balance a moderate or even generous fat intake with plenty of polyphenol rich, deeply colored vegetables, as I describe in my blog post, the colors that heal you eating the rainbow. Many of my clients, especially those with SIBO, that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, will have fat malabsorption as revealed by stool testing, and they will need to limit the amount of fat they eat to reduce digestive symptoms until the root cause of the fat malabsorption is dealt with. Also, if you have gastroparesis, that means food is sitting in your stomach for too long undigested, then high fat meals are likely to exacerbate your symptoms. What I do recommend for most people is to, at the very least, enjoy fats as they are found in food by choosing the full fat options of natural whole foods such as avocado, olives, nuts and seeds, organic grass fed meats, wild oily fish and full fat dairy produce if tolerated, as well as some additional fats in the form of extra virgin olive oil, ghee, coconut oil and palm oil. This would be closer to the diet of our ancestors. Not all fats and oils are beneficial however, and some are clearly harmful and how they are processed and used may be harmful. For more information on this, please see my video Which Fats and Oils for Optimal Health. Thank you for watching, I hope you have enjoyed this video.